Matthew chapter 24, we'll be reading verses 3 through 8. We're on a series that is called 2020. Today I want to speak to you about external signs. What are the external signs that Jesus mentions prior to his coming, the second coming of Christ? The Bible says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, Jesus, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many would come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nations would rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Would you do me a favor? Would you repeat after me your word? is written in my mind your word is hidden in my heart your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path i will seek you with all my strength i choose to live my life according to your word your word O oh lord is eternal you may be seated Matthew chapter 24 is a prophetic chapter. Jesus is foretelling what is to come before his return. He is sitting on the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives has been a go-to place for Jesus. In today's term, it was his prayer closet. A place of solitude where he can be alone with his father. It was his platform where he taught and he preached. This was also the place, according to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, where his feet will stand on the mount in his return. It was in that very moment where he shared with the disciples some external signs that they would hear of wars and rumors of wars. It's not like the disciples had Fox News or CNN to see everything that transpired in the world but today we do we, we can know when something happens across the world in real time earthquakes and famines are external signs but Jesus says don't let these signs alarm you don't let the external eruptions create internal disruptions these are signs to tell you my return is soon, but he says, the end is not yet. These are signs are, are the beginning of birth pains. I remember 13 years ago, my wife was pregnant, very naive, very ignorant of the process of pregnancy. We took my wife into um, the hospital. She was, she was having a lot of contractions and as we took her into the hospital, the, the, the doctor told her, oh, you're in labor. The moment she said those words, I went in a panic. Because I thought that when she says you're in labor, I thought it was going to happen like that very second, that moment. I did not know that there was a process to the labor. I did not know it was going to take my wife 22 hours of laboring to finally complete the process. I, I want to share with you today that when we talk about labor pains and when Jesus says that these are the external signs of labor pains, this is the process before the coming of Christ. Jesus cautions the disciples on these signs because they can easily serve as a distraction. I want to give you this first point to lead it up to my second point. Don't let these signs become a distraction. These signs were not meant for it to be a distraction. 
Distraction comes from the Latin dis, which means apart, and traher, which means drag. So distraction is when you're dragged away from your task. When you are distracted, you lose focus on the big picture. These events can come with much anger and anxiety, fear. And if we let these emotions dominate and linger, it would cause you to mistakenly prioritize. So my question for you today is what distractions have you prioritized over your faith? I'll ask it one more time. What distractions have you prioritized over your faith? Having faith is not being in denial. It's not being in denial. It's hope in God. Having faith is not dismissing reality. It's hope in God. A person who is in denial is a person who rebuttals facts. Faith over fear is deny, it's not denying that you are struggling with fear. It's placing God above your fear. See, we can easily lose our purpose and miss the mark when we live in distraction. What the enemy wants is for you to put your emotions over your faith. He wants you to put your fear over your faith. He wants you to put your anxiety over your faith. He wants you to put your sickness over your faith. You are not denying the realities of what you're suffering. You're not denying the realities of your struggles nor of your challenges. What you're saying is this is real. But my God is bigger than what I'm facing in my life. If you don't have a healthy filter, our emotions will create toxic expressions. When we, you, I, are inundated with so much bad news, our emotions become attached. That's why some of us, we've created filters. We've created times of when we're going to shut the news out. We gain enough information to know what's happening. We gain enough information to be current with what's taking place, but too much of it can become really distracting. Too much of it can become really overwhelming. If you don't have a healthy process and a healthy filter, this can begin to stem in a negative manner. It is natural as humans to have some sort of fear and worry. When we hear, see, or experience these very signs, but the right process and the right filter can help us sort these emotions out. Our eyes have to be fixed on Christ. He is our filter and our eyes need to be fixed on Him in the process. Putting our eyes on Jesus is our process and should be our process. I like what Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. That whenever we fix our eyes on the distraction, then that can become overbearing. But when we put our eyes on Jesus the same way that Peter put his eyes on Jesus when he was walking by faith out of the boat on the water, he dismissed everything around him. But the moment you get distracted because of all the noise that's around you and you lose sight on Jesus, then that will become the king and that will become overwhelming. And before you know it, you can easily start drowning. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me you got to recognize that when that is said, it meant that you are going to have challenges, but through Jesus, you're going to get through it. You're going to be able to complete it. You're going to be able to have, uh, to be able to heal from it. God does not deny the facts and the realities of what you're going through. He does not deny the pain, but what he is saying and what Paul wrote in Philippians 4 is that with Jesus, Anything is possible. There is nothing that comes against our God. 
In no way is Jesus denying the realities of the signs we see with our eyes, nor is he denying the challenges that come with these signs. God is not denying the pain, the destruction, the casualties that these signs can cause. Jesus is not lacking empathy, nor is he being insensitive. Jesus is simply preparing us on how we should see and respond to these signs. That is why the very first thing Jesus said was see to it. that No one leads you in the wrong direction. And make sure you don't panic or fear. Don't get distracted by false prophets and don't get distracted by signs. Don't let the noise that surround the birth pains develop instability in your faith. These signs are signals. These signs are evidence. These signs are a notice of what is to come. Jesus wants us to know he is coming back again. But in the waiting season, as we are in the waiting room, as you hear, see, and experience these signs, Jesus is saying, many don't know me. Many are lost. Many are confused. Many are broken and need to hear the hope that only I, Jesus, can give. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the filter in which connects us to the Father. I know we as Christians are anticipating the rapture and the fulfillment of Christ's return as judge. But there is one reason why Christ has not yet returned. And it's found in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Bible says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Why has Jesus not yet returned? Because he wishes that no one should perish. Why has Jesus not yet returned? Because he is, play, he is wanting for all to repent. I want to tell you that your prayers are being answered at this very moment. And the fact that Jesus has not yet returned is an answered prayer. Because he's giving another day for your son. He's giving another day for your daughter. He's giving another day for your friend. He is delaying his return because he's waiting for them to come into a place of repentance. I understand that sometimes you may be eager and desperate and you feel as if God is not listening. Can I remind you today, Jesus not returning is an answered prayer for you. I am burdened to respond in such a way to share about Christ's love to those who haven't yet reached repentance. That is why I believe these signs are notices for us to keep witnessing. Why are these signs there for? It's not to distract us, but it's for us to be eager and zealous about God's word and about those that are lost. Patience is a gift that God gives you and I every single day when we get up. It is a gift because when you and I were lost in our transgressions, it was his patience and his love and his mercy and his grace that gave us another opportunity. Patience is a gift. Patience is God's hope to us all. If we don't have hope, then what do we have? If those that are spiritually blind don't have hope, then what do they have? I believe the reason that God did not reveal to us when he will return is the hope we have in another day. And to treat every day as if 
it's our last. It is our time to be urgent. An urgency to preach, to teach, live and display Christ to people. Tomorrow is never promised to us. But every second alive, God displays His grace and His patience. Just did a funeral of a 10-year-old girl. And was watching TV in her living room. When a straight bullet struck her and killed her. We are living in a time where the next second is not even promised to us. We as Christians cannot sit back and wait for something to happen. But we have got to provoke. And we've got to go into spaces where nobody else wants to go. That why all the people want to be in the mountaintop. We want to go into the valley. When everybody else wants to always just be in the prayer closet. That there's some other folk that want to put legs behind the prayer. And preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Billy Graham said it well. That if you have to use words then use them. Outside of that just show the love of Jesus to all that can see. Again when Jesus was speaking he was telling this to his disciples to all believers Jesus is coming back and I say that not so that you can stare in the sky nor so that you can sit back because you're saved this is not a statement to threaten people or to scare people the fact that Jesus is coming back should motivate us to preach the good news and allow our lives to point people to Christ you know what my answer is to all that's going on in this world? My answer is Jesus. And I'm sorry, no one in this world is too smart to fix anything. And let me put it this way. No one can fix what's happening here today. But I know someone that can fix all things. I know someone who is without fault. I know someone who is without error. I know someone who is without mistake. I know someone without blemish. I know someone who is perfect in all of his ways. When Christ was taken up in Acts chapter 1 verse, F, uh, verse 8, he was ascended into heaven prior to that. This is what Christ said. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The disciples, when Jesus mentioned that we're in the waiting room. What they knew, what they experienced was Jesus in flesh. They have not yet encountered God, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, you will encounter him. And when you encounter him, you will know. The Bible teaches us that the disciples were in the upper room and they began to pray. And something supernaturally began to happen. There was a mass crowd of people that began to hear all of this crazy talk. All of this un. Uh, 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 all of this language that was unknown and they began to say these people are up there and they're drunk and there is a man by the name of Peter that after the encounter with God and the Holy Spirit filled them up he preached the word and the Bible says that thousands came to know Jesus I want to tell you that you and I are not left as orphans but when Jesus ascended to heaven, he says, I leave you a comforter. A comforter is not just another person. I'm here to tell you the comforter is the trinity of God. It is the third head, the third person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What is our assignment? Our assignment is to be witness. To share and testify on the blessed hope we have in Jesus. The external signs should keep us on our knees praying for this nation. Praying for the destruction. Praying for the hearts. 1 John 5.11 says, and this is, and this is the testimony. What is your testimony? This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. 
What is your testimony? Your testimony is the fact that you've got eternal life. Now, your story on, on your journey may look different. But at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus and how Jesus transformed you. There are folk that sit back and say, I don't have a testimony. No, you have a testimony. The fact that God saved you, the fact that God restored you, the fact that you recognize that he is Lord, your story may not be as dramatic as the neighbor next to you. Your story may not be because you came out of an addiction. Your story may not be because you were saved from a situation that was horrific. I'm here to tell you, everybody has the same testimony. And that is the fact that God gave us eternal life. So when you witness, talk less about you and more about Him. I'll say that one more time. When you witness, talk less about you and more about him. Can I break this down just a little bit more? Go straight to the point. The fact that you did all this and that is irrelevant. But the fact that Jesus came into your life is the key fact that you are no longer the same. That the old is gone and the new has come. Don't talk more about you. But put yourself in the shadow of the presence of the Most High. And speak about the goodness of God. And how he saved you. And how he makes you feel. And how he restored you you your story is irrelevant without Jesus my story is irrelevant without Jesus and today I want to give everyone an opportunity for two things number one to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior to receive him and the second thing I want to do is I want you to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can be a witness to other people to give you the courage and the boldness to live for Jesus and speak for Jesus. You may be sitting back and asking yourself, can God use me? Yes, God can use you. And how marvelous it is that God can use a broken vessel like me to be such an example for others that are broken. Don't you know that brokenness can relate with brokenness? Don't you know that valleys can, can relate with people that are in the valley? I don't know how long you've been out of the valley, but let me take you back to the day that Jesus left the 99 to go after the one. Let me take you back to the moment where you were in your deathbed. Let me take you back to the moment when you were so depressed because your husband left you or your wife left you. Let me take you back to the moment when you could not look beyond the very moment that you were living in. Everything ahead of you was bleak. Everything ahead of you was dark. You had no hope in your life. And then something happened to you. You had an encounter with Jesus. That even in the midst of your suffering, you experienced peace peace that even in the midst of your suffering you experience his love and something took you out of the mud that you thought you can never get out of I believe that God is looking upon this people and he's saying what I done for you testify so that others can know the same God that is in you is the same God that can be in them the same God that saved you is the same God that can save them would you stand to your feet I am ready to revolutionize this city. Come on, you life covenant. I am ready to pray down heaven here on earth. I am ready to be able to be a light in the midst of darkness. If you're watching me online, it is for you to declare that only God and faith in God above all things can trump any distractions that are in your life. So if you're in this room and you're saying, I, I need salvation. I need to get saved. I am in the valley. I am lost. I want that Jesus that you're speaking about. I want that hope that you're talking about. No man 
can give it to you. No relationship can give it to you but Jesus. And if that is you today, if you're in this building, if you're watching online, you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to right now to lift up your hands if you're in this room. I want you to respond right now in the comment section. We're going to put a barcode and on that barcode is a prayer. And I want you to fill it out because we want to cover you. We want to pray with you. We want to walk this journey with you. I see your hands. Anybody else in this building says, I need to receive Jesus. I see your hands. You don't need to be afraid. This is the, I see your hands. This is the greatest decision you can make in your life. Here's my second call. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to prophetically speak so that there can be results at the end of it, and it is not human results, but it's God results. Uh, the Bible says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God is looking amongst the people and saying, how many of you today will respond to the assignment that I will be an ambassador? I will be a mouthpiece. I will shine and be a light. If that is you, lift up your hands. And we're going to get into this song right here. And I want you to open your mouth and open your heart as we go into a time of praise and a time of worship. Receive it in Jesus' name. God can heal you physically, that God can heal you emotionally, that God can heal you mentally, God can heal you spiritually, and I'm not sure in your life what you're facing and what distractions and what challenges you have, but the song that we just talked and sang about speaks on the breath of God. When Jesus resurrected, Bible says that he returned to the disciples and when he returned to the disciples he first thing he did was that he breathed on them this is significant because remember when God created Adam it was the breath of God that gave him life and also gave him authority the authority that God had in heaven God gave it to Adam 
And God told Adam, with that authority, you can name every animal that is in this land. Sin took that authority away. Jesus became the second Adam. When he died and resurrected and reappeared to the disciples and he breathed back into them the breath that was taken out because of sin was reintroduced when Jesus breathed into the disciples and not only did he give them life but he gave them authority this is why Jesus says greater things you shall do you today have the authority to pray over your own mind over your own heart and begin to cast out every feeling emotion thought that does not belong to the Lord so I want you to put your hand in the area of your body right now come on we're gonna declare it we're gonna sing this song we're gonna declare it and the authority that was on Jesus given to the disciples it is on you I want you right now with that authority to begin to declare it over your body healing over your mind healing over your heart come on
but I believe it. You know why I believe it? Because the Jesus we serve is undefeated. So much so. The greatest enemy of all, death, could not even defeat him. Death could not even defeat him. Faith over your mountain. I don't see it, but I believe it. Come on, you may, you may need to tell yourself that I don't see it, but I believe it. I'm not denying the realities of it, but my faith over my Goliath. Ah, faith over cancer. Come on. Faith. Faith. What is it that you need to have faith over? You can do all things through who? Through Christ who gives you strength. If you receive that, I need you to clap your hands in the building. Come on, new life at home. Go ahead. Clap your hands. Put the clap emojis in the comment section. If you receive it. Come on, a little bit longer than that. Come on, if you receive it. If you receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You just got the devil all mad because he thought that your sickness was going to keep you down. But you believe it. So when you walk out of this place and when you continue your day, walk with your head up. The gift of patience, the gift of God's love is beautiful. Embrace it. We're about to leave this place, not the presence of God. Would you lift up your hands for the benediction? We love you, New Life Covenant. Thank you for your faithfulness and your tithings and giving. Thank you for your faithfulness and your service for the kingdom of God as we do outreaches in our community. Thank you. Until we see each other again, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord guide you. May the Lord shine his face upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May he give you strength, peace throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you so much.